The first thing Luke says in his second volume, in my earlier work, so if you haven't read it, for God's sake, go out and buy it now, is now going to, in the end of the Gospel, Jesus ascends. He's not this is the beginning of the story of the church. But he's not going to begin the story of the church without the risen Jesus, is he? He's not going to start with an absence. He's going to start with a very lively presence of Jesus being in the midst. He'd shown himself to them alive after his passion for 40 days and he's at table with them and he tells them again in case you missed the first volume simply to wait until something happens to them and that shows you dear friends that the the truth that the church is rooted in attachment to Jesus discipleship begins by the challenge follow me and that is the evangelists emphasize they go after him right they don't go after a mission they don't go after a job description it's very personal and their authority for mission will come out of attachment to him remember jesus's question to peter not did you graduate with honours from the University of Jerusalem? Do you love me? And when Peter says yes, Jesus says, then feed my sheep. But don't do it if you don't love me. The authority for ministering in Jesus' name is loving attachment to him. Without that, it simply becomes a career. And Luke shows it. See, remember, Luke's a writer. He has to show things. He has to show them if, he, if he's writing them. And he shows us that. And, of course, the 40 days connects it to the wilderness experience and also both in the Old Testament and the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Then there's a mission to the world. Um, see, a lot, of thi a lot of people believed when the Spirit came, it would be the end of the world. That's it. And he's going to clarify this. Um, the outpouring of the Spirit, because one of the things that divided the empty church, the early church, was the belief that the end of the world was going to happen soon. If you believe the end of the world is going to happen soon, you don't build churches or schools. And you don't write books. There'll be nobody to read them. <laughs> the fact that Luke is writing this book means that he believes clearly the end of the world is not going to happen that quickly. And that salvation, and this is very important for Luke, is not limited to Israel, but extended to the ends of the earth. Now, question for the early church. Some of them believed that the end of the world was going to happen in their lifetime. And some of them quoted Jesus. Jesus says, this generation will not have passed away until all these things are accomplished. And should we open up the church to those who are non-Jews? This was a great question for the early church. Or do we let Gentiles in, but say they first have to be circumcised. Okay? And I love this bit. When Jesus ascends, two angels ask them, Why are you men of Galilee staring up into the sky? 
that's a not very missionary position, is it? Uh, the danger is that's what the church could have looked like. Simply waiting for the end. And if that's your image of the church, the church is going nowhere. Pope Francis, it's on the back. Has anybody got a copy of Emmaus? Um, on the back. I'll tell you why Pope Francis got elected to be Pope. He addressed the cardinals before. He says the future of the church, the fundamental choice facing the church is between an evangelizing church that comes out of herself or a church that lives within herself, of herself, and for herself. That, to him, was the challenge of the future of the church. And this is the problem here. A group of people who are simply waiting for the end. They don't see any point in mission, in preaching. And if the end is going to come soon, thanks, Lev, it can make you very self-centered, can't it? Remember, some of you will remember this. It was about 10 years ago, maybe more. There was a group of Christians in Korea who believed that the end of the world was happening, and they had the date. They gave up their jobs, everything else. One woman had an abortion so she could ascend quicker. Time magazine had a big cover story of it. And they all went up the, to the top of the mountain for the end of the world. And guess what happened? Nothing happened. They should have read the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. And the Apostles are concerned about this question. And he says, it is not for you to know the times and the dates the Father has decided by his own authority. Don't you be worrying about when the end of the world is. Your job is to do what? Is to mission. So this image here, the church, this is Pope Francis's point, the church should not look like a community staring into the sky, concerned only about itself, waiting for the end of the world. It's not a very missionary stance. Now, Luke's the only one. The women will be delighted with this one. Luke is the only evangelist to recognize the key role of the women in the story of Jesus. Luke says there are three groups that go back and they wait and pray together. Okay, who are the three groups? The eleven apostles. What can the eleven apostles not witness to? The death and burial of Jesus. Who can do that? The women of Galilee. And Luke gives them their unique place. This is the core, the, the nucleus of the church. It includes not just the male disciples, but the women of Galilee. And he also has Mary and the brothers of Jesus. And Mary, remember Luke has an infancy narrative and Mary is the only adult from the infancy narrative that comes into the beginning of the church. Luke's very clever. The three parts of his gospel, the infancy, the public ministry, the death and resurrection, the principal witnesses are here. But they can only do this together. Isn't Luke lovely? You won't get this in any of the other Gospels. The three groups, these three groups, <coughs> are absolutely core to the beginning of the church. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, problem. 
When Jesus goes, who will have authority to speak in his name? Who do you think? Who is the head of the church in Jerusalem? It's not Peter. It's James, the brother of the Lord. It is not James the Apostle. The head of the church in Jerusalem is from the family of Jesus. Now this doesn't get advertised very much in Catholic circles. And when they meet at Jerusalem, Peter speaks at the council, but James says, I rule. Are you taking notes? He rules. Okay. Jesus belonged to a line of monarchy. How does authority pass in monarchy. It always passes through family. Queen Elizabeth, God bless her, cannot choose a disciple to take the throne after her. It has to go to Charles or skip a generation. It would have to go to William. There's no choice. Monarchy passes through family. And Jesus belonged to a monarchical line. Now Bishop Eusebius, who was Bishop of Caesarea, he wrote a book called The History of the Church in the end of the 4th century, and you can still buy a copy. How about that for lasting? <laughs> and he says, up until the end of the 1st century, all the churches in Palestine were ruled by the male relatives of Jesus. There was an early understanding that Jesus' family would have authority. In other words, the church could have been split in two between those who followed the family and those who followed the disciples. What happened when Muhammad died? The whole place split into two. Why? One group followed the family, the Shias, and the other group, Sunnis, followed the disciples. And they hate one another. That could have been absolutely repeated in the Christian church. And they've got to solve this problem. Listen to this. By the time Mark comes to write his gospel, at the end of... The, this is a real problem for the early church. As we said, it doesn't get advertised very much. Um, but you can see it right inside the gospel. At the end of chapter 3... Um, Jesus' relatives in Mark's Gospel think Jesus is out of his mind, right? And they come to take charge of him. His mother and his brothers arrived and they stood outside the house. Keep remembering where they are, outside the house. And they asked for him. A crowd was sitting around Jesus at the time the message was passed to him. Your mother and brothers are outside. They're asking for you now. Twice we're told where the family is. It's outside. He says, who are my mother and my brothers and sisters? Where does he look? Mark says he looks at those sitting around him and he says, here are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. Where does that leave the family? It leaves the family outside. 
Mark is very clever. Mark says, yes, authority passes through the family. But you then have to ask, who is Jesus' family? He redefines his family in terms of loyalty to the Word of God. Now, Luke doesn't like that. Mark leaves the family outside. And the big question is, will the family ever come inside and be together with the disciples of Jesus. What does Luke do? That's what Luke does at the beginning of the Acts. He has Mary and the brothers of Jesus come inside the circle. And they are there together, waiting and praying with the eleven apostles and with the women of Galilee. Is that making sense? And when they're together... Luke says, who gets up to speak with authority? It's Peter, not James. Luke has come down on the side of the disciples, against the side of the family. And he has Peter, when they're all together, he has Peter speaking. Is that okay for that scene? It's, it's a tough scene, especially for Catholics who've got a great veneration for Mary, that he leaves mummy outside and redefines his family in terms of... But I think Mark's got a specific reason for doing that, to show that Jesus transfers his authority to his new family. There's the eleven, there's the women... Mary with the brothers. He's the only evangelist to say that if you're going to testify to the memory of Jesus, then you need more than the apostles. The community can testify to the memory of Jesus. That community will become a community of spirit. But first you need the memory. What do we say after the consecration in memory of his death and resurrection? We, your people and your ministers. The memory of Jesus becomes, dear friends, very, very important. And Luke is going to argue that the church needs to be both. It has to be a community that can testify to the memory of Jesus. But it also has to be a community of mission, not just stuck with a memory, but has a view and a powerful mission to the world that is waiting. The apostolic community, dear friends, is linked back to Jesus through a community of memory. And we have to build our own link. And you don't just stare at the past. So you see down at the bottom, Luke's has a wonderful image of the church. That it keeps alive the memory of Jesus. But it's not fixated by the memory. Because sometimes the memory of Jesus is not enough. The church is going to face questions that Jesus never faced. And there are questions the church faces that cannot be solved by consulting the memory of Jesus. You know the question, what would Jesus have done? That's guesswork. Remember Paul. He said, it has been decided by us and by the Holy Spirit. In other words, they consulted the memory of Jesus on this, and the memory of Jesus didn't come up with anything. So there's a sense in which the memory of Jesus and the Spirit is needed profoundly by the church, both of them. 
that the memory of Jesus roots Christianity in particular loving attachment to him. I mean, the Jews venerate Moses, the Buddhists, Buddha, the Muslims, Muhammad. But they're not asked to love Moses or love the Buddha or love the prophet. They're asked to venerate Moses and the Buddha. Christianity is different. In Christianity we're invited to love because we were first loved. But that's the appropriate response to Jesus. And that memory of Jesus is a cr critical corrective to independent spiritual experiences. There's a famous scene in Matthew, and this should shock you a little. Sometimes the gospel evangelists get up and say, I'm going to shock somebody today. It is not anyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, who will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the person who does the will of my Father. Now this is the last judgment. When that day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Others will say, Lord, Lord, did we not work miracles in your name? These are miracle workers. I shall turn to them and say, I have never known you. Why? They've dislocated themselves from the memory of Jesus and they're into spiritual performance. It's a hard, you, you would think people who could, who could work miracles in the name of Jesus would be secure. And it's an argument against people who forget the memory of Jesus. They become unearthed. And they can invent themselves. They're into their own kind of performance. So that, in other words, there's a danger that without the memory of Jesus, you have a church just reinventing itself now, focused simply on the charismatic gifts. But, the, but this is true as well. It's more than memory. It lives in the faith of the living Lord it does more than look to the past. It faces the present and looks to the future. And as said there, without the memory of Jesus, the community can invent its own values and become historically disconnected from Jesus. But there can be an excess of memory too. Think of a prayer group. And someone mentioned something, and this lovely lady gets out the New Testament. She said, I th Jesus had something to say about that, checking the memory. And the guy sitting next to her shuts the book and says, close that book, the spirits in the group. They both need one another. <laughs> we need the sacred memory. And we need the Spirit. There are some people who think God stopped functioning in 1960. The Vatican Council. That he went quiet. He's gone on holiday. They worship the memory of things as they used to be. There's a lot of people in the church who are practical atheists. They don't believe God is really functioning today. And they're trying to get things back to the way they 
they worship the memory. And the danger of that is you end, you end up polishing antiques. The memory without the spirit embalms the church. You can praise the past, the good old days, holding on to the past without being open to the spirit, what the spirit is doing now. You can lose the feel of his presence now. Memory is embalmed. Mission can turn to dull obligation. Without the spirit, the community can be reduced to a group of museum attendants guarding a treasure. Dear friends, when you think about it, Christianity is a generation away from extinction. It always has been. If this present generation does not pass on what it treasures, Christianity will become a museum piece. When most Catholics think about tradition, they think about tradition as something you hold on to. But tradition is something you pass on. Remember Paul, I handed over to you what I myself received. That's been a characteristic of Christianity from the beginning. You don't keep it to yourself. If you keep what you love to yourself, dear friends, when you die, there will be a double funeral. You and what you cherish. Christianity has always had this compulsion from the very beginning to share the experience, to hand over the love, to share what you know, what you believe. And if that doesn't happen, we're going to end up as a section of the museum, like the Assyria rooms in the British Museum where you go and you see what people used to cherish, what they used to believe in the old days. And that's why that aspect of the mission characterizes the church today. And is, you know, if you, t in our parish in Clapham, we've got a large parish down in Clapham, very good parish. If you took out all the immigrant groups who have come in, you would have a white nursing home at prayer. <laughs> You've got a group that's coming in alive to the tradition and the church is going to eventually probably depend on them to hand it over remember that woman that Jesus argued ferociously with the Syrophoenician woman Jesus is trying to have three days off up in Tyre and Sidon with the apostles and they're having a wee walk through the marketplace probably looking at the vegetables and this woman comes out screaming her head off. Remember. Kiri Lyson, Lord have mercy. And Jesus ignores her. She's a foreigner. Ignores her. She keeps on shouting. And the apostles go to Jesus and says, for God's sake, will you do something? She's embarrassing us in public. It's a good reason to minister to people because you're embarrassed. And he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
He sounds like an exhausted parish priest <laughs> who's got enough on his plate. <laughs> he refuses. Why? No, this is not Luke's gospel. This is Matthew. She's the wrong kind of person. She's been refused twice. This woman is tough. So she goes right in front of Jesus and kneels in front of him. Stops him in his tracks. And asks again. And he says no. I'm not going to give the food reserved to children. I'm not going to give it to dogs which is what the Jews called the Gentiles. You have a, a hangover of that in the English language, going to the dogs, which doesn't mean you're going to the dog races. It means you're selling out. This woman has been refused three times. And then she says, so... I'm a dog. Well, even dogs get fed. Oh, give me dog food. She converts Jesus. He changes his mind. And what does he say to her? Great is your faith. And I think that story is almost like a history of the early church. The initial followers were all Jews. And then you've got these foreigners wanting to come in. Like the parish priest way back in Dover in the 80s. And he came to Hoxton and he said, Father Dennis, my parish has been changed in nine months. The immigrants now outnumber the locals. And the parish council came to me and said, Father, why don't you say Mass for them? For them at eight in the morning. And then we can have the usual Mass at half ten. <laughs> That's what the church could have ended up looking like. Total schism according to race. And Matthew refuses that. And Matthew shows Jesus struggling in this, probably as a reflection of the way the church did. Dear friends, most of us want to be left alone. And the danger is when you see all these foreigners coming in, you think, God, we're going to lose who we are. We're going to be, end up singing Ebo. And Tagalog. <laughs> and all these different choir languages. That's understandable. People get threatened by new people coming in. There's nothing odd about that. But what happens when eventually you come to see that these people are bringing something? They're bringing faith. Woman, great is your faith. And eventually the Gentiles will take over the church. <laughs> the story, in a funny way, of the beginning of the church is a story that's happening in Catholic parishes all around England and Scotland and Wales. <laughs> it's like a miniature repeat of the early church. If you want to join our church, you have to be like us. That was the early argument. You have to become a Jew. Because Jesus only had Jews, you know. And eventually, their eyes awaken to the gifts the new people bring. First of all, you see threat. Foreign language. Different colors. Different dresses. Have you ever seen a Nigerian woman on a high day? I mean, wonderful colors and everything. 
and the drab grey and blues <laughs> disappear and eventually you see that these people are at the heart of religion. I mean it's happened all over. You get a big group and then they say well let me phone the Archbishop of Warsaw and get a Polish chaplain and he'll look after this lot. And Matthew keeps on saying no and Luke keeps on saying no. It's open to everyone. You don't have to belong to any particular race or caste or colour or background. Everybody's at home in this church. And you know who you heard that from? You didn't have to wait until the resurrection narrative to hear that. Remember old Simeon? Luke loves old people. He's the only one to have Zachariah and Elizabeth. And you see these. And then you see Simeon and Anna. Ancient. I love Luke. He says, he sa he says um, Anna was 84 years old. Her days of girlhood were over. And you say, look, that's unnecessary information. <laughs> but he's emphasizing that these people are long on memory. You've got it again. And yet, what are they doing? They're totally alive to something yet to happen. They're not just hugging their memories. That wonderful English poet, if I can remember his name, he was in Leeds as a library. Philip Larkin. And Philip Larkin wrote a book about old age and about some of the problems, or one of the problems. He said, you know, they live in lighted rooms in their head where all happened once, not here and now. Not here and are all about memory and the trouble is the longer you live there's more of the past and there'll be a lot less of the future <laughs> so it's a temptation to look in the rearview mirror <laughs> and yet Zachariah and Elizabeth and Simeon and Anna at the beginning of the gospel are all utterly alive to something that is yet to happen they're a community of spirit not just a community of memory <laughs> and Simeon says about Jesus right at the beginning of the gospel when he holds this child this child is not just for the glory of his people Israel this child is a light to enlighten the Gentiles right at the beginning of the gospel you'll only hear that in Matthew's gospel at the end Jesus becomes a Catholic only in the last paragraph where he says go make disciples of all nations. During the ministry he forbids them to minister to Gentiles. That's why Luke who is a, the only non-Jew writing in the New Testament is a Gentile himself. He has this profound belief which I think is lovely. You live in a community that cherishes the memory of Jesus. And that memory is kept alive, especially in the Eucharist, with the presence of the Lord among us there. But it's also a community that is sent. I thought I finished there. I ran out of the last two slides. But is there any questions on that, on the community? See, sometimes when you have a deanery meeting or a meeting of community, there are some people who are big on memory in the group. And there are some people who are big on spirit. And you need both. <laughs> you need the memory. And you need a community that prays to be instruments of the Spirit. You need both.
praise God, I always become a charismatic at the end. <laughs> praise the Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> Listen, thank you, dear friends, very much for coming and for your loving patience <laughs> during this time together. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.